on today's Locked on Thunder podcast, it is time for our annual Stock Watch episode where we buy and sell stock in every Thunder player currently on the Thunder roster and evaluate later on after the year's over how we did. Did we make money, lose money? What happened to the Stock Watch? We'll keep track all year long. Also, update you on training camp and practices from the Thunder. All of that and more coming up on today's show, Locked on Thunder, your daily Thunder podcast. You are Locked On Thunder, your daily Oklahoma City Thunder podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Let's get it going on the Locked On Thunder podcast on the Locked On Podcast Network, your teams every day. I am your host, Aaron Chief, over at thunderousintentions.com. Media member Ryland Styles. You can follow me on Twitter at Ryland underscore Styles. It's at R Y L A N underscore S T I L E S. Follow the show on Twitter at L O Thunderpod. Email the show, L O Thunderpod at gmail.com. Call into the show, 405 362 7128. On today's show, we're going to buy and sell stock in each player on the Thunder roster ahead of the 2021 22 NBA season. And also, update you on what's been happening throughout Thunder practices. And the Thunder are back on the court again today, practicing ahead of their second preseason game of four, Sunday in Milwaukee. Let's start there with the training camp update. No new injuries, and Derek Favors practice today. That's awesome. Of course, Vit is dealing with that visa issue, unsure when or how that gets resolved, but eventually it will be. And Favors is still practicing. If you listened yesterday, you know his plan was yesterday contact, today contact, off day Friday. And they're going to likely travel Saturday. I would assume this part is guessing. I would assume he travel day Saturday and then he plays Sunday, maybe. Maybe makes his debut on Sunday. Who knows? We'll see when the time comes. Uh, There was a lot of Aaron Wiggins praise today, and I was here for it. Lou Dort said that Aaron Wiggins is doing the things that Dort did whenever he was in that two-way slot and and was trying to make a name for himself, trying to become an NBA player, that Wiggins is doing that same thing. Mark says that Aaron Wiggins has a ton of advocates in the building. And I think that that's very important. Mark Dagnott is not somebody who is a head coach that only takes his own input, right? Like, Like Mark seems like the kind of coach who takes input from various sources, whether it's in the front office, on his coaching staff, the team doctors have influenced how he handles shoot around. He told us that this morning. In that media session, as I've been in there for you know, over a year now with Mark, he seems very genuine, very open, and I have always gotten the vibe that the buck might stop with the head coach, but he's going to take a ton of information. He's not somebody who's going to reject information. So if you've got something, a lean or a whatever opinion, he'll hear you out. And if he has a ton of advocates for Aaron Wiggins right now, I would imagine that that will influence Mark in terms of playing time. Now, he's a two-way player. Wiggins will play a ton with the blue. And, of course, as a two-way player, you're kind of behind the eight ball a little bit. But this is also an organization that organizationally believes in that two-way slot and has a track record of converting two-way deals. So you have that going for you. And a head coach who will listen to outside sources, I think, just from the vibe I get from him. And those outside sources or advocates of Aaron Wiggins. I think it's a big deal for Wiggins' development that Mark believes in him and others believe in him as well uh, to kind of put him in that situation. And I think that it's good that Mark is helping and and his hands-on with Wiggins. He mentions how, yeah, you know, he came in, lit it up from three, but he was playing like a player who was on a two-way deal in the sense of it seemed like going, I I went back and watched the game again yesterday and broke that down as a kind of film study for thundersintentions.com. But it seemed like while Wiggins played very well, Don't get me wrong. It is impressive what Aaron Wiggins did in that Monday game whenever he's unsure if he's going to play. The other two-way guy that Paul Watson Jr. played, but the training camp invite guys didn't play at all besides nobody played. The the only invites are DJ Wilson and Rob Edwards. They didn't play at all. So you're unsure if you're going to get into the game. He gets like, what, the last seven minutes, and then he goes off uh, for knocking down a few threes. And Mark mentioned how while it was great he hit the shots and it was great the shots fell, he played like a player that was kind of holding the ball too much offensively and was trying to prove that he belonged there. 
And I think that Mark might be trying to get across to him that like, look, it's great that your stat sheet was awesome this game. It could have easily, though, you made some tough shots, could have easily not been awesome. And so you can impact the games in more ways than just the stat sheet. Like we have the capability as coaches, you know, speaking what, with like what I think what Mark was going to be trying to relay to Aaron Miggins, but they have the possibility as coaches to evaluate the game more holistically and not look at the box score to where that there's little subtleties that Wiggins can impress the staff with and earn more minutes than just hitting a difficult three-point shot, which most of the time won't go in. Right? Like even the best of the world uh, miss difficult three-point shots. So making the right read on, on the defensive scheme, making the right rotation, making the right pass, all those little things that don't show up on NBA.com box score can go a long way, more so even than making a difficult three-point shot. So I think that it's great that Mark not only has shown that there's advocates for Aaron Wiggins, but also has been hands-on in developing him and investing into him because getting the investment is what you need in any walk of business, right? Like if, if my bosses were not helping me out and saying, Hey, you could have done this better. You could have done that, have done that better. I would have, you know, I, I would feel like, Hey, I'm not really somebody they're trying to improve on and somebody they're invested in. And that's never a place you want to be. Like you always want that feedback. You always want that criticism. You always want that constructive criticism or else they're going to be fine to replace you. If they haven't invested anything into you, what are you to them at that point from a employee standpoint, which is what you know, players are employees, especially players trying to make it in the NBA. So I think it's great that, that Mark is invested in Aaron Wiggins already and that this organization seems invested in him and they're going to treat him like he's a draft pick, which he is 55th overall pick. And I think they can make it. I think that he can really make it and really make it a long way. In the league. I think they can be a three and D type of player and we'll see in stock watch whether I'm buying or selling stock in him, but it was a ton of Wiggins praise. Now, the last part of the presser that was interesting, pretty light day today, of course. Mark again referenced that Shea and Dort understand the bigger picture, which I find interesting because Mark Dagnon and Sam Presti, they've both been consistent in that messaging. We know that there's certain lines that we hear all the time from players that seem like, hey, there's some sort of coordination going on here. And maybe there's not, but it seems that way because players are always saying around the same things about certain subjects. And it seems like this year, one of those things that they're trying to get across to everyone is that Shea and Dort understand the picture in Oklahoma City, understand what they're trying to do. So you couple that with the immense reputation, right? It, it's just a widely known thing, how upfront and honest Sam Presti is with his, with his players, veterans, uh, what the plan is for them, how they're going to sit them at the, mid, at the midseason like he did with Al Horford last year. Like it's been reported by everyone who's credible that the Thunder – almost uncharacteristically, uncharacteristically from like the NBA perspective, the Thunder almost, you know, kind of not naturally in terms of the NBA landscape are very honest and open. So whenever the messaging is, these guys get it, these guys invest in the franchise, they invest in the franchise, they get the bigger picture, they understand it. When that's the messaging for an organization that is so upfront and so honest and transparent with his players, it feels like whenever you ask the questions to me on Twitter and in the emails about, well, what will Shea think about losing? What will Ludworth think about losing and growing? It seems like they're on board. It seems like that they understand, hey, this is our chance to not only develop as players with the minutes loads that we get and the spots we get put into, but also build something in Oklahoma City and also you know, improve the team in the long run by playing these young players. That It will result in losses. You know, Young teams in the NBA typically don't fare well. They're projected to finish last in the NBA or close to it by everyone that you hear. But they understand in the long run, this will be better to where it's not going to sour them on the franchise. And hearing Mark and Presti push that and push that messaging, and then also Shea in his media day session push that messaging, messaging it, it really kind of validates all of that in the sense of you shouldn't be worrying right now about what – Shea feels towards the franchise and just listen to him and accept him uh, for what he's saying, what Sam's saying, what Mark's saying, these guys that know him very intimately. There hasn't been reports like there has been for Zion or even last year at the start of the year, Trey Young had a weird quote out there about you know wanting to win right now. And luckily for the Hawks, they did win last year. They went very far in the playoffs, uh, but there hasn't been that for Shea. And so until there's a ripple effect, until there's a reason, you shouldn't be like doom scrolling on Twitter and waiting for uh, a notification from Woj that Shea's unhappy because every message we've gotten from everyone who would know has been that he's very happy and he aligns beautifully in the words of Sam Presti with the Thunder 
and with the organizational viewpoints and with what they're trying to build. So I thought that was interesting that again today, unprompted, we got something from Mark that again shows, hey, Shay understands what's happening here. I know that a lot of you were concerned about that, but today, I want to say right now, our good friends over at Sweatblock. Sweatblock is an incredible product. It's doctor created, doctor recommended, and works up to seven days per use. Dry shirt guaranteed. Do not fret about what you're going to wear. Wear what you want. Wear what you're comfortable in. And be comfortable with Sweatblock because Sweatblock helps you not pit out, have pit stains, and kind of ruin your great shirts. You need Sweatblock in general because it's your secret to confidence and it can help you get through that presentation, get through that date, get through whatever it is, get through this podcast. Very, very nervous today. Very nervous energy for me today. I don't like that. But sweat block, I should have used it before this podcast, gives you that confidence boost. I'm talking real fast. I don't know what's going on today. I'm all jittery. Could have used sweat block. Go check it out today. Wear what you want. It's your secret to confidence. Everyone needs this in their toiletry bag. You just do. You just need it. So go get it. Sweatblock.com. Promo code locked on. We do 20% off. Promo code locked on, sweatblock.com, 20% off. Also find it at CVS and Amazon as well. It's the number one anti-perspirant product on Amazon. It is time now for the annual edition of Stock Watch. Yeah, they're penny stocks. I told you not to sell. You did not tell me not to sell. I said the market fluctuates, remember? Well, what are you going to do about this stock? I'm keeping it. I'm going down with the ship. Celebrate with our weekly act of debauchery. That is right. It is stock watch time yet again in Locked On Thunder world, right? So this is what we do every single year. And what this is, is it's just taking the phrase that you hear all the time on Twitter or on NBA podcasts. I'm buying all the stock I can in this team or this player or this idea, right? And it's saying, okay, let's take that phrase and make it legitimate and make it something we actually keep track of. Because it's easy to sit back and say, oh, I'm buying all the stock in the Mavericks this year. And then the Mavericks missed the playoffs because, you know, maybe Jason Kidd was not the best hire to go for. And eh, you don't bring it up again, right? You don't, you don't bring it up again. You hope everyone forgets about it. It was a podcast you did back in October on the 6th. Who cares, right? This way, what we're doing here is we're going to mark this down in an Excel spreadsheet and you send in your answers too. And I'll mark down your answers and we'll see who kind of had the better ROI, so to say, on their predictions about teams, about phrases, about players. On this specific episode of it, this is what we do to start every single season. We go down the entire roster and buy and sell stock in the players. Who do we think will have a great season, a bad season, an okay season? Like, what do we make of these players? Now, in the coming weeks, we'll have this on Stock Watch Friday, every single Friday. And at that point, we'll start buying stock and say the Nuggets will be a top four team. That's like an example of, it's not a player, but it is like a, a prediction that we can buy stock into or sell stock into. Pretty easy process. The only twist here is I'm actually going to keep track of these and then we can revisit them at the end of the season. Let's start with the easiest answer. And, and again, tweet me your answers at Rylan underscore styles. Thank you for making Locked on Thunder your first listen every single morning, your daily listen. We're here for you every single day. So tweet me your answers at Rylan underscore styles on your players who you're buying stock into that you can either buy stock, hold stock, or sell stock, of course, just like the real thing. And let me know your biggest debates because this one should not be a debate. You should be buying all the stock into Shea. Like Shea should be your guy. And I think that the most interesting part about Shea is how he adapts, how he adapts this year. Now, I'm not going to take anything from the preseason, especially preseason game number one. Whenever Shea admits to the media yesterday, that he was tired and that he was kind of not quite himself, which is understandable. He didn't get to play much this summer until later on in the summer. He hasn't played NBA basketball in a long time, and he's coming back from that injury. It's understandable. So I'm not going to take much from this from this preseason. But teams will get more and more sneaky with, with their disguises on defense and when they throw the double, at what point on the floor do they throw the double. As teams know, Shea's a great driver. He's a great drive and kick option. But the options around him might not be that reliable. And there's just no way of getting around that to where if you're an NBA defense and you've got to go to a coach's meeting at 930 tomorrow and game plan for the Thunder right now, you'd grab your cup of coffee, you'd sit at the table and you'd say, take away Shea. And you know what? If Lou Dort drops 50 like he did against Utah, okay, we lost. But we're not going to let that guy beat us. 
or at least you're not going to try to let that guy beat us. And if Pokashevsky becomes the unicorn against us, okay, at least it wasn't Shea. That's the mindset you're going to have this year as an NBA coach. How does Shea adjust to that? How does Shea adapt to that? He has a unique ability to beat double teams off the dribble. He just does. Like, like It's impressive at the way that he can kind of maneuver through a double team. He's also a good passer. How do the defenses react to that? How does he react to the defenses? And can somebody step up and help him? What are going to be his best lineups on the floor? All right, like That's more so what you're interested in than the kind of overall player because you know he's a great player. He's a max contract worth, worthy player. It's incredibly rare that a contract is so universally praised. And, and part of that was because the Thunder had so much money. But you know, everyone agreed, yeah, he's worth a max. The Suns went to the finals this year, and they're not sure if they want to give the max to DeAndre Ayton, which, by the way, great fit in Oklahoma City if they do kind of have a stalemate and a kind of messy divorce. But nonetheless, that's besides the point. Everyone understood, yeah, you got a max Shea. Yeah, I would do that too. Having that type of talent, unspeakable. I mean, it's just amazing. And so how does he adjust now to the adjustments? Because teams will make it. But he's a great player. Buy all the stock you can in him at any price. Lou Dort. I'm also going to buy stock in him. And it's only been one preseason game, but he shot the ball well. He looked good shooting the basketball against Charlotte. So if he's going to bring back that good three-point shot, plus play elite defense, why wouldn't you buy stock? He's going to be a very, very good player. Darius Baisley is the first one that's not a no-brainer. And we're already seeing people on Twitter criticize Darius Baisley and bash Darius Baisley. And it's kind of exhausting. But I'm buying all the stock. In fact, I'm buying like 16 shares. Now, I'm not a day trader, so I don't know if that's actually a lot of shares. But I think it is. 16 sounds like a lot of, a lot of shares, I guess. I don't know. But I'm buying a ton of shares in Darius Baisley. I think that last year was a weird year in general. I think that he's been a part of two of the weirdest seasons in NBA history with the bubble season and the last year's COVID season. Two of the weirdest seasons in NBA history while being a New Balance intern the year prior. Not a great recipe to start your career. And also, I don't think that Mark and his staff used him properly. I have been nothing but positive in um, hyping up Mark and his staff. I've already dubbed him as the number one coach in Thunder history. I think that he's your coach long-term. I think that for this team to win a championship, it can and it will be best served to happen with Mark. I, I think that he is simply the best that this city has ever seen as head coach. But the one fault last year to me was his utilization or lack thereof of Darius Baisley. And the problem is whenever you're evaluating coaches and you know kind of schemes, you're just kind of guessing, right? You're just kind of guessing, okay, well, was Baisley standing in the corner because Baisley wanted to stand in the corner of that play? Or was the, was the action, the set designed to where, yeah, Baisley's in the corner, just camping out there. That's not what you want Baisley doing in my opinion. You want to use his athleticism. You want to use him cutting. You want to use him as a ball screener. You want to use him in ways that he can be mobile. And also, he is a great playmaker at 6'9". You want to allow him to show that in the NBA, an area that he's really not gotten that chance to yet in his NBA career. And that's one of the biggest areas, and in my opinion, the biggest area of why he was a first-round draft pick is because he's such a good playmaker at his size. And we haven't seen him in that position yet. And so while last year was disappointing for Darius Spacey, it was very disappointing and I can agree to that. I'll also say there's other factors than just Darius Paisley. And I don't get why people are so down against, you know, against him on Monday. Because he goes over four, sure, doesn't score a point. Let's review this, right? Every shot was open. He had an aggressive drive where Kelly Uber made a great play, slid over, blocked him from behind. Sure, maybe you can say he shouldn't have cocked it back and he should have just kind of finger rolled it. Sure, that can be a complaint that you have. But in general, great night from him. Very active on the glass. Did a great job playing the passing lanes and baiting LaMelo Ball at one point to a turnover, using that length, that athleticism. Great job at the five spot in the small amount of time we got to see him play the small ball five, which you know, if you've listened to this show since I took over back in the bubble, I was pleading on my hands and knees, almost literally, for Billy Donovan to play him at the five against Houston. That's an area I think that he thrives in. And we want to see that happen more uh, for this season. So he was good on Monday. Like the stat line isn't great, but if you actually go down and break down every shot, they were open, good looks, 
He played better, you know, better aggressiveness. And also, again, not utilized in the perfect way. It was another game where there was no kind of flow to the offense. It was kind of more ISO and just standard pick and roll stuff, which is understandable. You're not really playing to win. You're not really playing to do anything in these games. You're just really running up and down the floor. It's almost just cardio at that point in the preseason. to just kind of get back in NBA shape. So, of course, there was not a ton of action. And so I want to see what basically looks like whenever there is a plan offensively before I start criticizing him. But I am all in on Darius Baisley. I, I truly am. And buying all the stock I can in Darius Baisley. Coming up, we'll get to the rest of the roster. But first, I want to say right now, but our good friends over at Built Bar. Built Bar is a fantastic protein bar that tastes just like a candy bar. You can go to BuiltBar.com right now and use your code LOCKED15 for 15% off at Built.com right now and try out one of their amazing flavors. Coconut, cherry raspberry, cherry barcia, mint brownie, double chocolate, salted caramel, strawberry, orange, cookies and cream, and German chocolate. My favorite flavor is cookies and cream. It's heavenly, and you know what? I've gotten confirmation from other hosts, including Josh Lloyd, host of the number one fantasy basketball podcast in the world, but it's also their favorite flavors. So try out cookies and cream. If you don't want to believe me, you don't want to take my word for it, that's okay, I understand, but you should order the mix box at that point, and that mix box will give you two of every flavor. You can try them all out, and then order the ones you love the most again. And whenever you do, for every order, use our code LOCK15 for 15% off your next order at built.com. Built.com, LOCK15, 15% off of your next order. What I say right now, we're good friends over at betonline.ag. BetOnline is your online sportbook experts. They have a new website, a new interface. It's lightning fast. Make sure you go sign up for a free account today. Whenever you do, tell them Lockdown sent you with the promo code, and they'll receive, you'll receive a bonus of 50% on your sign-up bonus on your first deposit. So your first deposit, you get a 50% bonus. How awesome is that? And guess what? OU plays a huge game this weekend. They take on Texas in the Red River rivalry. Not as good as the as the Division II Red River rivalry between Cameron and Midwestern University, but still pretty good. Still pretty good. You can bet on that at betaline.ag using our code locked on and receiving your 50% welcome bonus on your first deposit. We are back on Locked On Thunder on the Locked On Podcast Network, your teams every day. Thank you for making Locked On Thunder your first listen every single morning. We're free and available on all platforms, including on YouTube. Now, let's get into the rest of Stockwatch. We've already bought on Shea Dort Baisley the buying is not stopping anytime soon because we're also buying on Josh Giddy. Look, I said on draft night, you know, this seems like an interesting pick here. You know, common sense says you go Kaminga in the sense of traditional thinking of where the projected rankings were, but Sam Preston knows more than I did. So I said on draft night on our live amazing studio show we had here on the, on the network. Uh, and after watching one preseason game, I'm not sure how your excitement cannot be up by a billion. We know in Oklahoma City what, blue chip guys look like blessed, fortunate, incredibly lucky to have watched three of them. And now watch Shay. And now watch Giddy. When you watch that game, even as it's one preseason game, even as it's one meaningless game in the long run, when you watch Josh Giddy, that is what a blue chipper looks like. That is what a prospect that can be a franchise changer looks like with these other young guys. While we really like them, Tail Malbon, Pokoshevsky, they are guys that you're hoping can eventually become something, and you're doing these mental gymnastics to get there, right? And it's easy to do. They have a path, each of them, to be great players in this league. But with Giddy, that path has very few obstacles. That path does not have many trees, branches hitting you in the face as you're walking down it. That path does not have very many potholes. It's a clean path, and Giddy looked like a blue chipper. Elite playmaking, effortless scoring, buying all the stock in Josh Giddy. Now we have another interesting one. Tail Malbon played the most minutes last year for the Thunder. Interesting guard. I said all last year, hey, this is going to be a sixth man of the future. He's got that sixth man potential. And a guy who you go to when you're good again to control your second unit 
and helps you win games. Because how often do we see that drop off from your top of the line guy, like Russell Westbrook, to the next point guard, and they just tank the entire unit, they tank the entire rest portion of Russ's you know, kind of game, right? The plus minus numbers, all that good stuff. So Malvon helps you steady that ship. He helps you limit the drop off. Anytime that you take Shea off the floor and put a new point guard in, there's going to be a drop off. If you had Shea on the bench, a player like Shea on the bench, you'd have a team we've never seen before. So limiting that drop off will be the most important part of this rebuild. And you do that with Tail Malvon. With Tail Malvon, I'm holding right now. I'm not buying any stock. I'm not going to sell him. I still think he's going to be a good player, but it's just kind of lukewarm, right? Like we kind of feel, and I know he's only 19 years old, but we kind of feel like we know the path for him. He'll be a good player. He'll, he'll work hard. He'll be my mature player, but he'll settle into that sixth man role eventually. And the rest is history, right? So I'm kind of holding on him and not really doing much with that from last year. Pokashevsky, I'm buying stock in him because I still feel like it's great value. I still feel like nationally, he's a punching bag. He's just kind of a funny looking guy that plays basketball and dances a lot on the sidelines and nobody knows what to get and what to get and what to expect from him. So I'm buying stock in him in that way of eventually people will realize, hey, this is not a meme. Like this is not a joke. This is a real tangible developing basketball player and he's going to be good in this league. And at that point, then the prices, so to say, get super high. And now you're just one of a million that like Pokashevsky. Right now you're almost still on the ground floor a little bit. So I'm buying in Pokashevsky. Had a bad night Monday, understandable, but that's the roller coaster. You're in for a fun season. Like these games are going to be fun because you just never know what's going to happen. It's like a box of chocolates. You're going to have terrible Pokashevsky nights, just terrible, embarrassingly bad, cringeworthy games. That's part of the, that's part of the thing. That's part of the development. You're also going to have nights where we race to the microphone and talk about how together Pokashevsky could be the next savior and could be the next better than Christoph Porzingis. We'll have both those nights this year. We had a bad night Monday, but don't lose faith in Pokashevsky just yet. I'm buying in stock. I'm also buying stock in Isaiah Roby. I think that the defensive improvements were noticeable in game one. Now, I do want to caution you and not get your hopes up and say, look, that Hornets team plays pretty small. I mean, Plumlee's the really only true center. They used him a lot on, in the pick and roll with LaMelo, with, with LaMelo Ball. He could play drop coverage on LaMelo Ball. And you weren't really worried about Mason Plumlee. So the defensive improvement is relative, right? You got a good matchup. Now the scoreboard doesn't look like it, but you got a good matchup to go small against. How does this matchup look and how does Roby look against bigger, more traditional centers? Yet to be seen. But for now, you can notice the improvement. And I still think that Roby's a very good player. You can talk about how the matchup between him and you know, Jeremiah Rumps and Earl, whenever you get down to the nitty gritty and you get down to the roster crunch and having to define 17 guys to help you win a championship, at that point, maybe having two players with the same skill set is a bit redundant and the Thunder need to move on. But you should buy all the stock in Roby as a person, great person and player. I think that he's carved out an NBA niche and an NBA lane where he'll be an NBA player for a long time, no matter the jersey. Hopefully it's in Oklahoma City, but no matter the jersey, Roby's an NBA player like for a very, very, very long time because of the way that he plays the game. And especially if you buy the the, the idea that he can be a better shooter this year. And I do. I think he'll be a very better shooter this year than he was last year. And so at that point, his value rises even more. So I'm still buying in stock. Now, Kenny Hustle, Kendrick Williams. We're going to rapid fire through the rest of these kind of, but Kendrick Williams, I'm holding. And simply because last year was great. It was fun. It was awesome watching him play. He'll be that blue collar, Nick Collison type of player, play style wise. And apparently if you ask the teammates and coach, culture wise as well, he'll be that Nick Collison role. I'm holding because I'm scared. I'm scared about the three-point shot. Was last year a mirage from three, or did he figure something out with his mechanics? And that's just the kind of shooter he is right now. I can see a case for each side. I can. So with that being said, I don't want to bank on that three-point shot being what it was last year. I'm going to just hold. I'm not going to buy anything else. I'm not going to sell anything else. I think he'll have a consistent season where even without that great three-point shooting, he still brings you a ton of value. But since we don't know about that three-point shooting, I'm not going to add anything to my investment, so to say. Now, going down to Jeremiah Robinson Earl, Jeremiah the Messiah, I am buying all the stock I can in Jeremiah Robinson Earl. I just think that this guy will be an awesome player. I think that he's going to be a great shooter for his skill set, for his size. 
a great pick and pop partner at the small ball five for SGA. A really good defender, like really, really good defender. A defender who I feel more comfortable with going against bigger players than other guys on this roster. I just love Jeremiah Robson's game. And we saw last, last, last game on Monday his kind of brilliance where, yeah, he gets two, you know, he gets two fouls quickly, then another two, he has four quick fouls. And most rookies at that point would just simply continue to be shell shocked. But it was almost like those four fouls and then talking to Mark as Mark said, hey, look, tone it down a bit, kind of zapped him out of it. Like, okay, this is just playing basketball at this point. Did not pick up another foul and played his style of game. You could really tell his first few possessions and minutes in the game, wide-eyed and, and was not playing his role, settled in nicely. And, and that, being able to adjust that quickly kind of proves how good of a pro he'll be because those adjustments typically don't happen minute to minute, possession by possession, timeout by timeout, half by half. It happens games and weeks and months at a time for rookies. So I like that we've seen that from Jeremiah Robson Earl. Trey Mann, I'm buying, I should say Ty Jerome. Don't want to jump the gun. Ty Jerome, I'm buying stock in Ty Jerome. I really am. I love what Ty Jerome did last year. And again, it's another player where who knows where his career ends up, but last year went a long way in proving he's an NBA player because the playmaking was great. He was a great playmaker for a bench role. And of course, he's not going to be your star. He'll not even be your starter on a good team, but the skill set of creating for others and himself and knocking down three point shots and having somebody who you trust to knock it down. When those shots go up for Ty Jerome, I think they're going in. They look good. They feel good. I think they're going to go in that confidence in a shooter. That's immeasurable. That is just incredible value for your second unit. So I'm buying Jerome as a player for sure. Now, Vit, I would say, I'm not sure. Again, I'm not a day trader. So I don't know what the correct terminology is for this, but this is like that, that, stock that you put money into and you know, Hey, this could flop. Like this could not go well. So I'm not going to do too much. Cause if it does flop, I won't be out all that much. I can sort of say, lose this money and not really care about it. But if I invest now and it doesn't flop, I'll make a ton of money. So it's taking that kind of calculated risk. I'm taking that with it because everyone who's actually watched him play full live basketball games. I've talked to like full on, not highlights, not YouTube. They love the guy. Mark has mentioned how he plays great defense and he's a good shooter. Great defense, good shooter. His size is perfect for the NBA. And he seems to really want to be a really good NBA player. So I'm throwing some money at Vit. Vit. I really am. Vit Critchie could be a good player for the Thunder. Now, and again, I haven't gotten to watch him play a full game live in person or even just live where there's no stoppages and no cutting out the bad plays or whatever and seeing how he reacts off ball and things like that. So I'm not going to say I know everything about Vit, but from the people I talk to who I trust and have seen those things, seems really good. Seems like a really good player. So now we're at Trey Mann. Trey Mann, again, I don't think it's proper terminology. Trey Mann is a, is a stock that you buy into right now and you understand, hey, I'm probably going to lose money on the front end, but I'm really buying in for the back end. I think that Trey Mann will struggle this year. I think that he will you know, have moments where he's on Shaq in a full lead. And, and not in, in the kind of the Pokashevsky way, but just like, oh goodness, he tried to step back three and he got blocked because he could not really time up when the defense was going to kind of jump at him or leap at him. And I think that will spend a lot of the league, a lot of the season in the, in the G League, in my opinion. Now that's, I just think that it's, it's probably not going to, you know, I don't know if it's going to be the case or not, but I think that Trey Mann with his skill set, elite shooting, creating for himself and others, competent on defense, and a incredible worker with the mixture of this is a franchise who believed in him and also has a great track record of player development. I'm not sure how that fails long-term. I'm just not. Because he has that NBA trait of being a great three-point shooter and a great three-point shooter who can create a shot. And you need shot creators. Tim Albon's great off the bench. You know, Ty Jerome's great off the bench. That bench is missing a shot creator. I can trust Taylor to knock it down. I can trust, right? I can trust Taylor to knock it down. I can trust Ty Jerome to knock it down. Can I trust them to create for themselves? And I'd say I'd lean towards that area with Trey Mann. And it might look bad this year. It might struggle this year. You know, the game and the, and the ability, you know, the it factor of creating for yourself. But he's going to be a very good player. 
you know, he's going to be somebody who you want long term. It's an investment. It was, it's not going to be a micro success, but I'm going to buy in right now uh, and get on the kind of the ground floor of the stock. Now, here's where we're selling. Mike Muscala, great person, loves the organization, loves the city, like genuinely loves the city. I love to see that. But we know what Muscala is as a player. We know that he will not be here as a player once this team wants to win championships. Pat on the back. Mike Muscala wants to be a lifer. He wants to be here for a long time. Great. But in terms of the stocks, there's no real reason to buy stock into Mike Muscala. Derek Favors, same thing. Favors is saying all the right things. Seems like a great leader. Seems like a great veteran who will help in any way he can and wants to help. It seems like he genuinely likes being around young players. He says that he keeps them, that it keeps him young being around young guys. It seems like he's not off put by being on a losing team and, and, and being on a team that needs that kind of um, presence from a veteran. And also, he'll play well enough, I think, to be traded at the deadline or sooner because he's such a proven commodity at a great price. And whenever injuries inevitably happen, which we hope that they don't, but it's inevitable, whenever they do happen, there are not very many better and cheaper options that you can get for like a second round pick than, than to get Derek Favors. So uh, I'm selling stock in Favors long term, but again, I think he's still going to be a good, valuable piece for the Thunder long, uh, you know, kind of in the short term. Gabriel Deck. I'm selling stock on him simply because I don't know what to do. Like Gabriel Deck is a weird scenario. I don't. I think he's a good player. I think he's a good basketball player. I think that he is an old school throwback player, but he's there's no denying he's a good player of the game. But at his age and his play style, does he fit the Thunder long term? Is he a trade chip for the Thunder? Like I don't know what the plan is. Maybe if I had Sam Presti's, you know, kind of playbook, so to say, and knew what they wanted to do at deck, I'd feel differently. But right now, from the outside looking in, it's hard for me to put the pieces together. Typically, you spend as much time around this and talk to enough people like I do that you, you can kind of put it together and make the pieces fit and then relay that information to you guys. I'm at a loss. I don't know how this fits in with the plan for the Thunder. I don't know how they view Gabriel Deck. He's a good player. And every time you watch him play, you can tell he's a good basketball player in every setting overseas basketball, Olympic basketball, NBA basketball, good player. How does he fit long-term? So with that, I'm selling it. Now, Paul Watson Jr. and Aaron Wiggins, I'm buying in both. I think Paul Watson Jr. last year played very well for Toronto, and it was not just a mirage and not just a kind of luck of the draw. Somebody had to play well for the Raptors down the stretch. I think he's a good quality basketball player. I also love Aaron Wiggins. I think that Aaron Wiggins can be a great player. I, I really believe in his 3 and D capability. And I think that Wiggins, you know, by post all star break, by March or whatever, it will be on an NBA deal. I just do. Now I'm selling DJ Wilson and Rob Edwards. Whenever you're not even going to get looks in the first first preseason game, the first one, you can't get on the floor. To me, and maybe it shouldn't, but to me, it tells me what I need to know about how uh, the organization views these invites. They're just here to kind of sneak on to the OKC Blue roster. And now we get to Mamadi. Ukiti or Ikiti or Ikite, Ukite. I'm sorry about that. Um, I would say that if you had disposable income, this is a stock where if you had a ton of disposable income, you would throw a few on Mamadi. He had some good flashes and some bad flashes on Monday, but he's so young and he fits what the Thunder are trying to do so well if he can develop properly that there's an outside chance that the first roster projection is wrong where they do find a way to keep Mamadi. Obviously, if I had to bet money right now, bet on that AG, I would bet, yeah, he gets waived. But he just fits what they're trying to do. And he can have such a great opportunity here to where I want to I want to invest a little bit in him because I think that the organization might want to invest in him as well. So that's where uh, we'll end things at the entire 20-man roster, uh, buying and selling stock. Let me know how you feel about every player on this roster on Twitter at Ryland underscore styles until tomorrow, whenever we give you what to watch for against the Milwaukee Bucks, be good and be good to one another. This has been the Locked On Thunder podcast on the Locked On Podcast Network, your teams every day. Thank you for making us your first listen each morning. For your second listen, go check out Locked On Fantasy Basketball.